This is Mark Phelps reporting for AvWeb here at EAA AirVenture 2023 in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Doug Rosendahl, who calls himself just an Iowa farm boy, gets to fly many of the most exotic vintage and warbird aircraft in history. Recently, Doug was honored to become the personal custodian of this highly accurate replica of the 1930s Howard race plane, Mr. Mulligan. AvWeb caught up with Doug sitting under the wing of Mr. Mulligan and asked him to tell the story of the original airplane and the replica. Okay. So um, this is Mr. Mulligan and Mr. Mulligan is, this airplane is a replica of the original Mr. Mulligan which was a uh, DGA-6 Howard. Uh, a guy named Benny Howard had been building racers for several years and he built some little bitty racers with Manasco engines called Mike and Ike and, and uh, he teamed up with a guy named Gordon Israel and they wanted to kind of change the way they approached racing and so uh, this is a pretty revolutionary a revolutionary airplane. It was built to be uh, a Bendix racer and the Bendix race went from the west coast to Cleveland and uh, and that was a long race and you know at that time the uh, the racers really were the epitome of technology in the uh, in the aviation world uh, you know we we're coming off world war one and there wasn't a lot of interest in the military the war to end all wars and you know we just weren't putting a lot of effort into that but the racers were um, going all out and uh, you know guys were building airplanes like this in garages and small shops and really uh, developing the technology that we use to win the war uh, this the subsequent war so uh, they built this airplane in 19 and finished it in 1934 and they were flying it to to the west coast at, at 21,000 feet and they became so hypoxic that they lost control of the airplane fortunately they regained uh, consciousness and but they were still hypoxic enough that they weren't able to land the airplane and they wrecked it so they loaded it up and took it home and rebuilt it and went back in 35 and this airplane flew from Burbank to uh, uh, Cleveland non-stop at 21,000 feet mostly and beat Roscoe Turner who stopped twice for fuel um, by 23 seconds in a cross-country race so you know and again the airplane Roscoe Turner was flying was a thousand horse open cockpit very radical airplane and most of the racers of the day had miserable flying characteristics just horrible and this is an airplane with a cockpit and a cabin and enclosed high wing monoplane and uh, went on to be the genesis of the DGA-15 which is regarded as one of the best airplanes of that period and so the things that they learned uh, in this airplane really really made the difference there. So uh, when they got to Cleveland uh, Harold Newman was there and Harold had raced several of Benny's other designs and uh, they decided what the heck let's enter in the uh, Thompson Trophy which was a pylon race at Cleveland and lo and behold it won they beat Roscoe Turner at that race as well and uh, it was this is the only airplane uh, the, the original Mr. Mulligan was the only airplane that ever uh, won both the Thompson and the Bendix Trophy in the same year uh, on the way to uh, the West Coast in 35 they shed her prop blade uh, and Harold Newman and his wife were flying it to the West Coast and crashed it and uh, destroyed the airplane. They were both uh, injured fairly significantly, but uh, but both survived. And and that was the end of the original uh, Mr. Mulligan. In the uh, early 80s, Jim Yonkin of the Yonkin family in uh, in Arkansas had uh, built a replica of uh, a Traveler mystery ship. And he brought it up here to Oshkosh and some of his cronies, it, the story is that some of his cronies, they were maybe involved in some adult beverages and they kind of challenged uh, Jim to build a Mr. Mulligan and that was all it took once Jim uh, decided he was going to do it. It was a fait accompli and good. And uh, Jim and his brother Bob uh, put over 8,000 hours into building what you see here, which is by far and away the most accurate replica of a uh, DGA-6 and they built it from drawings, model airplane uh, uh, sketches and, and, uh, and just pictures from the day and it's a remarkable airplane. Uh, Jim invented the first uh, HSI for general aviation aircraft, the NSD-360 
and he developed some technology that made it possible to put a vacuum driven G a DG in the panel of an airplane and there are still lots of uh, NSD 360s flying today. Jim invented the Century th Series autopilots, the one, two, three, and four autopilots, which are, you know, I've got one in my Baron, and it's just a fantastic, uh, uh, especially when you couple it to GPS steering, still a very functional and fantastic autopilot today, all the way back to the, uh, the 60s. It, that's just incredible that, that that technology was developed then by Jim. And then after he retired from his avionics career, he uh, restored a bunch of airplanes, uh, Staggerwing Beaches, put a bunch of modifications into a Staggerwing Beaches that made the landing gear much more reliable. Um, and, th and then he uh, started building the Golden Age Racers, first the uh, Traveler and Mystery Ship and then this airplane. And following that, he uh, teamed up with a guy and started True Track, which was a revolutionary autopilot in the home built experimental world and ultimately went on to certified aircraft as well. So, uh, Jim Yonkin had an incredible impact on general aviation as we know it today. I got to know Jim because I was an RV guy, flying RVs at that time, and uh, he was selling True Track autopilots, and we immediately became uh, friends. And when he passed, uh, uh, Matt and his cousin were insistent that I uh, become the next custodian of this airplane, and it's been a it's been a great time to uh, have this airplane and take it out and get it back out where people can see it. Because well, I've been incredibly uh, incredibly lucky in aviation. Um, I was a private pilot with about 800 hours, and I was driving home from work one day, and there was a DC-3 at our airport and I slammed on the brakes and pulled into the airport and that airplane had arrived to uh, initiate FedEx service to our town. And uh, I met the guys that owned the airplane and uh, we got along famously and uh, about six, eight weeks after that I was a co-pilot on a DC-3 flying FedEx Freight at night. And so that started what's been a really interesting aviation career for a dumb farm kid from Iowa. Um, and I've been uh, really lucky to be able to fly some of the coolest airplanes uh, that are out there and uh, it, I, I tell people it's not about skill I have an incredibly average skill but I have remarkable experience based on the airplanes that uh, I've been able to fly and uh, that keeps opening more and more doors for me so uh, you know from from night freight I transitioned to Warbird started flying the B-25 and uh, and more than more time in the DC-3 and the PBY Catalina and several others and from that I transitioned to fighters and been able to fly most of the significant fighters of World War II and it's just been an incredible run and uh, I also you know have, have, I own a Myers OTW and I, now I have this airplane and a Taylorcraft L2 so I appreciate the antiques and the vintage airplanes as well uh, but uh, uh, again, I'm living proof that if you want it bad enough and you work hard enough, you can accomplish anything in this business. Uh, that's the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. I fly the CAF Redtail and, uh, and have been honored to tell that story for over 20 years in the, in the CAF Rise Above program. And it's just been an incredible career. And, and again, I've uh, been so fortunate. And I would tell anybody that, uh, that has an aspiration to do what I do, the secret is showing up, working hard, and flying the airplane like you're paying the bills on it yourself.